Hello. I am looking for a potential wife for my beautiful son. His name is Salta, and he is as gentle as his name. I am really excited to have grandkids. The younger, the better. I am typing this for him because of circumstances that I will soon explain. But do not be concerned. I will give you all the privacy you will need. My son was only twenty when he passed away. The doctors said it was so quick he may not have even realized that he was dying. He had recently moved away for university, and as he was walking on campus, he just collapsed, and that was it. A ruptured brain aneurysm. He had never had so much as a bad cold before. When I gave birth to him, I was forced to abandon my job and become a housewife. I was bitter about it, but when I saw him in my arms, I knew it was worth it. I rarely saw his father, who had been transferred to another prefecture, but it was probably for the best. Neither of us were looking for the love of our lives. We just wanted to start a family to get everyone off our backs. It was always me that watched over Selta, that raised him. That fed him, that clothed him, that took care of him, that walked him to school and from school and his friends' homes, and it was Salta that gave a meaning to my dull existence. But now he was gone. How can I describe the pain one feels when they lose their most beloved? I did not care about any other being in this world. I had no one. I barely had myself, and yet. I was still alive and had who knows how many decades left to suffer alone. I went to the funeral. We were all wearing suits far too thick for the humid summer, as we silently lit incense and waited for Selta's body to burn. Relatives, friends of his, teachers, both past and present, had come to pay their respects. A few of his friends were weeping silently in the back. I was too devastated to think. So I was just automatically following tradition. As we separated the bits of bone from his ashes and passed them from one to the other, I watched as everything that was left of my dear Salta was sent away, and I couldn't handle it. I'm not sure how I got away with it, but I kept a bit of bone for myself. I took it home with me and hid it under my pillow, as tears finally burst from my eyes, and the reality of it all was finally too much to bear, as my wails and curses echoed throughout the house. At some point, my body passed out mid-wail, and I fell into a deep slumber. Every time I opened my eyes, reality would strike me again, so I would get back under the covers and cry myself back to sleep. I do not know how many days had passed before my husband came back from his business trip and found me, dehydrated and starved. He called an ambulance, and I had to spend some time at a hospital under supervision. Eventually, the pain turned into nothingness, and the doctors deemed me safe, so I was allowed to go back home. I unlocked the door, took off my shoes, and whispered a tired. I'm home, as I stepped inside the hallway. At first, I did not notice the reply. I was already up the stairs when it dawned on me that someone had said, "Welcome back." I stopped and pondered for a while. "Salta," I asked in a whisper. "Downstairs," a voice answered from the kitchen. A voice that was unmistakably my son's. In the kitchen, my son was sitting down and staring at the blank screen of our turned-off television. Mom, I can't turn on the telly for some reason. Oh dear, he came back all this way, and that's the first thing he does. Salta, have you tried calling the NHK guys about this? Salta, yes, Mom. Salta, are you feeling all right? I guess I wasn't. I decided to go upstairs, take my medication, and go to sleep. He was still in the kitchen the next day, still staring at the black screen. Salta, why are you here? He seemed confused. He stared at the ceiling for a few seconds, trying to come up 
with an answer. You know, it's funny, but I'm not exactly sure. I can't even remember coming inside the house. Souter, you're dead. He just stared at me for a while. I told him what had happened, and he just silently listened to me describing his death and funeral. I started crying halfway through, and he put his hand on my shoulder. I couldn't feel it, but I appreciated the gesture. Such a caring son. He was simply there, like his regular self, but he could not pick up or move anything in the house. I tried to make him a meal, but he could not pick up his chopsticks to eat it. It seemed that spoon feeding him would work, but once he moved from his spot, I saw all the food splattered on the ground. He said he could not feel anything, but other than that, he was fine. So I guess that was that. I would turn on the television and leave him to watch programs while I moved around the house, and sometimes I would turn the paper so he could read books. My husband could not see him, and he seemed unable to stray too far from his bones. And so my life was back to normal, as my dear Selta was by my side at all times, once again. A few years had passed and Selta had not aged a single day, his remaining spots of teenage acne still marking his dimples, his hair always the same shape, a style I found rather silly, but young men will have their silly fashion, I guess. His shirt and jeans never having a stain on them. He greeted me one morning with a serious look on his face. What's wrong? I'm bored, Mom. I am so incredibly bored. Do you want me to buy a plan with more channels? I need people to talk to. The solitude is driving me crazy. I felt hurt that he felt lonely, despite having me around all day. But I sort of understood. We all need people our own age. So I asked my husband to have internet installed at our house. We joined Reddit, and I would type out whatever my son felt the need to say, and scroll down for whatever he felt the need to read. But it was not enough. I noticed his sad smiles. I noticed the looks he gave to some of the sketchier ads that popped up in the corners of some websites. I noticed the way he wanted me to click some things, but was too ashamed to ask. My dear son had come of age some time before. He had needs that a mother cannot meet, and a sense of shame towards me that he could not overcome. I love my son more than anything, please understand. And I realized that there was only one way to help. He had told me about all the friends he had made on campus before. I snuck his bones into my purse and visited his university for graduation. He came along and saw all of them grown up and moved on. They recognized me and paid their respects to a poor, grief-stricken mother who had come to see the graduation ceremony that her son would never attend. They could not see nor hear him, but he could see them, and I could see the way his eyes sparkled whenever he saw someone he held dear, and I could see the way he blushed as a beautiful girl walked up to me. She had been in his math class and had found an office job in another prefecture. Her long locks were braided together in a fancy bun, held together with flowery pins, and she wore her formal graduation clothes with grace. The way she shyly tried to meet my eyes was endearing. She was, by all means, perfect. I followed her after the ceremony and choked her on the side of the road. I cut off some of her locks and hoped that it would be enough, placing it under my pillow next to Salter's bone. I went to bed, hopeful, but the next day, Salter was still alone. As we were not formally acquainted, I was not invited to her funeral. What a missed opportunity. But still, there are plenty of beautiful girls out there. One of them had to be destined for my dear Salter. The next week, 
I went alone to a resort in the northern part of the country. I took my purse with me to the baths and watched Salter as he ogled every single young girl in the room. Perhaps his standards were lower than I thought. One night I bought one of them some drinks and we decided to go to the baths to evaporate our drunkenness. And I drowned her. I left the baths and came back an hour later, letting out a high-pitched scream to let everyone know that I had just found her. They said she had probably fallen over drunk and drowned in a freak accident. I made a scene and asked to be invited to the funeral to pay my respects. Once there, I sneaked in a bit of bone in my purse and took it home with me. She was in the kitchen the following day, making awkward conversation with Salter. She screamed as she saw me and Salter could do little to calm her down. But we had all the time in the world. Things would work out eventually. I was sure of it. After a few weeks, she stopped screaming and cussing whenever she saw us. After a few months, I caught her holding Salter's hand. After a few years, they set up my husband's room as theirs and I let them have their privacy. My Salter, forever young, was so incredibly happy. His wife, Akari, seemed to stop resenting me after a while. They made a perfect couple. Almost. After even more years, I could hear them fighting. It did not take that many fights before Sauter said he'd had enough and told her to leave. They came inside my room and asked me to take her bone away and give it a proper burial, which I did. Once the procession had started, her body began disintegrating. In between tears, she cussed me. What a rude girl I had chosen. The other week, Salter once again seemed glum. I think he's feeling lonely again. Lately, I find him sighing at family dramas. Perhaps this time I should find him a nice girl, one to start a family with. Please, let me know if you are interested. <laughs>